Ren, I just give a few straws of facts and figures around this technology. You are at the heart of it. You know, Imad Mushtaq and you uh, have created Stability Diffusion. Help us understand why is this being deemed such a disruptive technology? So thanks, Shoma. Maybe like uh, you already eloquent, most eloquently explain um, why this technology is getting <clears throat> very disruptive and potentially transforming the society. So I think uh, to directly answer your question, maybe my first answer will be there are previous version of the AI and the current version of AI, or the, maybe the next version of AI. So let me explain. The, the, one, the current, the new one, which we call a generative AI, is critically different from the previous version of the AI because back in the days when we were talking about AI, it's about studying hundreds of millions of data and then trying to get the answer, is this dog or not? Dog or not? So by studying hundreds of millions of data, your input was zero or one. <clears throat> As opposed to that, the generative AI is trying to understand the relationship between concept, idea, tangible object, visual effect, so that this, this generative AI model understand the connection between that, so that based on that understanding, this generative AI model can literally generate new visual artwork, meaning that by, it's the same, it's understanding hundreds of millions of data, but the output is billions of. Right, yeah. so you know, Ren, you were saying, I'm going to ask the console to play this uh, film, which you said to give the audience a sense of what this technology can do, you'd like that film to be played. So if I can just ask the console to play the India Moment film. Ren wanted us to show this is because every single image that you saw there has been generated by the technology that they've released. In 15 seconds, you write some words and these images come up as though India Today's star photographers have been all around the country, you know, capturing India. So that's, now Ren, tell us, you know, so we've, just, this is just the beginning of it. Mm. Uh, Chat GPT and others are synthesizing thought, synthesizing, you know, medical lawyers, we'll come to human displacement. First, help the audience understand that you guys in this already very disruptive world have done something even more disruptive, which is that you made all this technology open source. You put it out there as a public good and opened it up for everyone to use. So tell us the vision driving this and what is the controversy? Why is it so controversial? So, so what we strongly believe in is this concept of the open source, <clears throat> because the you know, the, there is no secret sauce. The recipe of making this generative AI is very simple. You, you need three ingredients. You need the data, you need the know-how to train the data, you need a humongous compute power. But we are adding one more secret sauce into the making of the generative AI model, which is open source, just as you as mentioned. So by opening everything to all the users and engineers and coders around the world, we are inviting them to use it, adopt it, and improve it. So by relying on tens of thousands of the, the engineers, else, even outside our company, our model is getting exponential growth. That's the first meaning of the open source, just like a Linux moment. The second significance, which I believe is very, very <clears throat> pertinent to the current challenges or some public policy debate, is open source means transparency. 
Because look, the generative AI is getting more and more the everyday thing, and then people are affected by the generative AI or using generative AI for their day-to-day -day body. You want to understand what is in the model, how you're training the model. Open source, we believe, is one of the most crucial answer to this question because we are ensuring the accountability, transparency. So if you are using like a proprietary model, you never know, oh, how you're getting this model into the fact. You know, you, you, you ask this model whatever questions, they give you whatever answers, but you may wonder why this model is giving me this answer. Unless you understand what is inside a model and how you train it, the accountability is not fulfilled. Yeah, so Ren, I, again, I just want to help the audience understand what's at stake. You know, I, I think a lot of us would have seen the film Social Dilemma. And just earlier, Rajdeep and Michael were discussing how social media has really polarized societies because the algorithms were driving a certain response. It was manipulated for ads, but it was also manipulated to release serotonin and uh, dopamine loops in all of us. So we get more addicted, our attention is grabbed. So what you guys are doing is that you're saying that all of us who are using this technology should know what was the intention of the company, whereas Microsoft and uh, ChatGPT have kept it closed, so it's the power is in a few hands. But the, the contra-argument to that is that now when you've made it open, even like really evil people could use it, you know, to create um, images of violence or pornography or, you know, misuse it as deep fakes. What is your answer to that? I think my answer is, the first of all, accountability helps people to understand what's going on. I mean, not fully understand, because even I don't understand how the neural network works, but at least you have accountability. Based on that, you have to choose which model you want to use. So there is potentially global one-size-fits-all model by, created by the huge corporation, but there is also potential with the advanced the, of the technology. There is the potential that every culture, every country, every ethnicity can choose and build their own foundation model. I think, which is another crucial thing, on top of ensuring the transparency and accountability, the next question is, you may want to control the model. So because the model is, for a good reason, is full of biases, cultural biases. I gave you this example jokingly this morning, but I tried the Japanese version of our stable diffusion and global English version of our stable diffusion saying Japanese businessman. In the global model, they generate the image like a guy who is wearing suit, flying business class or at least premium economy class and you know, such a nice business person. But when you say Japanese business person to the Japanese model, what the model generate is sad, middle-aged, tired, <laughs> faceless corporate employee who is commuting to the office every morning in a crowded train. So, you know, the, the outcome is totally different, and then which is clearly affected by the cultural bias. So I think that my next message is on top of the accountability. You have to own the model. You know, Ren, that's really interesting. So when we were trying to generate these images into mid-journey, I put Indian something, something, and every time I got red Indians, you know, with all headgear. So the idea of India and any images of India, like you said, so then when I put India, uh, it started generating really sad, you know, like everybody was, so there was a very Western uh, gaze on what India is and is not, so it was a big struggle to generate images like that. So there is that cultural bias. But, uh, you know, the other danger of this, before we come to all the opportunities, is that, you know, we're already being so rabbit-holed into silos, you know? Yes, social media has done fantastic stuff, but all the technology, like anything you Google, you're only given what you like. You're on Twitter, it's tracking what you like, it only serves you what you like. So we're just getting imprisoned more and more and more into completely closed solipsistic cells, you know, I don't understand you, you don't understand me, our realities are completely different, because there's a technology out there imprisoning us in just our own likes and stuff. So I don't get you because I'm, now this technology is going to force us even further. You're saying that on your, uh, you know, very powerful technology, India could create its own bias, Japan can create its own little cultural thing, you know, chat GPT is going to become a search engine, 
So when I search, it's not even going to give me five articles. It'll give me a synthesized article which some technology has done. It's a very terrifying, polarizing world. What's your answer to that? Are you guys even discussing this? I think uh, that is an uh, excellent and a most challenging question, but maybe I, I can break down into like a two-folded question. The first one is, even, even if you're living in a rabbit hole, which rabbit hole, which value do you want to live in? So you want to live in somebody else's foundation model, or you want to live in your own Indian foundation model? So, I mean, I'm, I'm going to the beyond this question soon, but the first choice is you have to make a decision which model you want to like live with. And then, even after you choose, let's say, if even after I choose the Japanese model so that I can live in my comfortable Japanese bias, then you are now presenting me with the most challenging and interesting pressing question. Ren, why are you living in a Japanese rabbit hole? Which is the most valid question. And then the answer will be, you know, uh, let me give you like a most stupid answer, which is, okay, in order for me, in order to ensure that I don't live in a rabbit hole, whatever question I ask this model, if the model is returning five answers, totally different, culturally different answers, like, can I cross... Can I cross the street when, even when the traffic light is red? If there is no car and I'm in the, in the, in the rush, can I cross the street? If I ask this, this question to the Japanese rabbit hole, usually they, they give me whatever answer, like no or something. But the other option is making sure that this model is giving you five answers. But what happens if you are confronted, if you receive five answers, people get easily bored. And then, a, and then the example you gave is excellent because the Facebook and Google and other current technology, the reason why people are addicted to that is they can easily associate themselves with the technology and then the answer or the service they are receiving is naturally what they want. So I think I don't have the answer to, to answer your second question, but it's our job, the everybody's job to come up with the right incentivizing mechanism to make sure that you are not overwhelmed by five answers, but you are feeling like, oh, I have some options. And then you are naturally incentivized to appreciate, appreciate your approach going beyond the rabbit hole. Yeah, but again, I'd, I'd just like to emphasize this point for the audience because, you know, again, until you use this technology, you're not really understanding what we are discussing and what's at stake. Because, you know, when Ren just said, okay, people will get bored if we give you five answers. The point is that right now, Microsoft, with whom we're going to have a session now, have just let go of the entire ethics team because they're in such a race with, with Google and with uh, uh, ChatGPT and all of that that they're in a rush to put out the technology because every bit of attention they get from us is releasing $2 billion for them a year. 1% of business they take away from these guys means $2 billion. So they've just sacked the entire ethics team, you know? And you're telling me that you don't want to give us five answers because that's going to bore the audience. But the point is you're going to keep pushing us further and further and further into rabbit holes. So I just want to leave yeah. that. I know you said you have no answers. But let me just move ahead because you're going to run out of time to the positive end of this, Ren. Uh, you guys have made all, your entire model free, but you're, you're imagining that countries are going to want to build their own models and are going to reach out to you all, or companies will, and you're going to customize models. So tell us for a country like India, what is the potential, the opportunities that this technology gives? So I think the, the potential, and potential of this, this technology is not just about having your own model. What is the potential application of these models? So one or two areas, which is obviously the lower hanging fruit for India, is applying this technology for education or healthcare or those, those areas which you are having some pressing needs. So if I may explain how this, like a model, the model is about understanding the culture and understanding, you know, you, it's becoming your brain buddy. So if you apply this model in creating AI tutor, AI tutor will be holding the students' hands and making sure that they are customizing the education journey 
to, to cater to the needs of the each and every different student. So I was reading this whatever, um, not I shouldn't say whatever, but this the UNESCO or OECD report that the India's say, the student to teacher ratio is like double of the, the OECD countries. Clearly, you know, that's not, <clears throat> it's the fact. You, you need more teachers here. But instead of just ramping up the number of the teachers, what, what's great potential of India is that more than 80% of the kids have access to the mobile phone. And why we're not taking advantage of that great benefit? If you're combining this digital savvy and accessibility to the mobile phone by the kids and this AI technology, you can come up with revolutionized the education system to be deployed and to the cater to the needs of the Indian unique situation. The same thing can be said for the medical um, services. Oh Ren, I, I know that this is opportunity, but I'm sorry as a journalist, my mind keeps going to the potential misuse of this because yes, even a country could design this, so maybe the Indian government reaches out to you guys to des further design this model for a cultural uh, circumstance like India. But that's putting immense power into a government's hand now, you know, because they will define the parameters. And then, because this is so convenient, none of us will be searching out knowledge in any other way except through a chat GPT or your stability diffusion uh, text image, you know. And soon you guys are going to do voice to image and voice to knowledge. But you're putting power in, like, knowledge seeking is just going to be defined by you or by the government or by someone powerful. So, I mean, I. I get it, there's a lot of opportunity, but it's frightening. I just want to share with the audience, we've discussed what's already there. What you all have released into the market, or what ChatGPT is, is based on, uh, you know, whatever we've used was a hundred and, uh, sorry, uh, 10, 10, 10 billion parameters was what ChatGPT was using and had put out. In these four months, the new ChatGPT4 that they've put out is based on 10 trillion parameters. So we're just a whisker away. Everybody's discussing what will happen if this technology becomes super intelligent and more intelligent than human beings. Are we looking at a post-human world where you know, species scale colonization is going to happen uh, on us? You guys are at the heart of this. What are you discussing? So I think the key here, I, I'm not, look, I'm not a computer science major. I, I'm, I'm a lawyer. But what is interesting, just clearly, as you said, um, <clears throat> Shoma, this is an exciting and potentially scary technology. But as is always the case with any new technology, even the best scholar, even the best professor, does not 100% understand where this technology is going, what is the limitation, what is the condition of this technology. I think my answer to your excellent question is, democratizing the process. So instead of, instead of stopping the development of the process, as far as you understand what is inside the model and how you train it, then the moment you started to see some existential danger, I don't know if it's coming or when it's coming, but the moment you found that there's an existential danger happening in AI, you reserve the right to stop at that moment. I think this is the way to strike the right balance between not too scared, but also allowing the technology to untap its potential to the fullest extent. Thank you, Ren. On that note, you know, time is up. So we've just, like, on all these sessions, you feel you've just touched the tip of the iceberg. I just want to leave the audience with something which Imad Mushtaq, you know, your, your founder, uh, has said is that he's treating this as a public good. These guys are the mavericks in a very dangerous technology and very powerful, positive technology. He said it's a public good and the public needs to discuss it, engage with it so that they're not just manipulated into being a recipient of a technology. And that's the best we can have. You know, the best model is a democratic one where there can be argument and we can at least have a voice in regulating it. But Ren, it's amazing to meet someone who's in the heart of something so epochal, and you already have legal suits against you guys, there's class action suits, and yet, you know, you're really keeping to the vision and mission with which you began. So thank you very much for joining us and for giving us insights into this. Thank you very much. Thank you.